meeting the mystical Monsignor. Sure, I, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, my story is similar to a, to a lot of people. I, um, um, I, I just knew uh, I'd seen Albacete uh, at various uh, movement events, CL events, um, and uh, and didn't didn't really know him for a little while until I was called upon to drive him somewhere. Um, I think that's how a lot of people have met <laughs> the Monsignor. And the thing that was, uh, that was I mean, I was fascinated by um, his, his talks, but what was really amazing to me was um, when in the car with him, uh, he was so fascinated and, and, and um, I, I guess um, intrigued by what, um, about my life, about me, about what I thought about things, even though he's, a rocket scientist and he's on tv shows and things i i, I was um immediately blown away by he, he asked me shortly after we got in the car about my opinion about the uh, theology of the body for example <laughs> i'm just a, a you know a, a college kid i think it was 2002 and uh, we had a we had a discussion about about it which i knew very little about um and, and we uh, dropped him off and that was that was the beginning of the relationship and then I after uh, after that you know I when I was at, at events you know he would he would seek me out uh, uh, sometimes and um, he eventually became uh, my confessor um, he's a interesting interesting priest to uh, get confession from um, and I, <laughs> I think that might also be another very common a anecdote uh, here but uh, uh, I just wanted to, to mention, uh, I mean, a few things. He had, he invited us uh, to me and, and my friend Rich over to his house uh, several times for, for tech issues like uh, fixing the Wi-Fi or if there's something broken on his, uh, you know, his email or he lost access to it. Um, and uh, I, I just remember that he, um, he, he would always, he would, I don't know, he would always seek out um, uh, those people who just were, were free with him. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it reminded me this morning, I was uh, watching the, the Albacete show, which you have, if you haven't seen it, um, you should go check it out. But uh, at the, near the beginning, Greg Wolf quotes, uh, quotes uh, Whitman, and I, I literally on uh, this last Wednesday um, was uh, watching a film with a quote from Whitman, not the same quote, but uh, it, it made me think of my experience of meeting Elvis that day, um, which is from Leaves of Grass. Um, it says, it goes, and henceforth I will go and celebrate anything I see or am and sing and laugh and deny nothing. And it, I immediately uh, thought of Elvis that day um, because that is the way that's the way he lived. There was nothing. There was nothing that scandalized Albacete. Um, he not only did it not scandalize him, it like the humanity, the difficulty of humanity and 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 um, uh, life just just drew him closer to, to everyone. He was he was fascinated like a like a small child um, uh, with with normal you know, normal everyday people, um, this, this rocket scientist. And, um, that's the, that's the story of, that's the story of how I met him. And, and, um, uh, uh, maybe a little bit later I can introduce, I'll see if my son will come in, uh, little, uh, Pietro Lorenzo, who was born a couple months after, after Albacete passed. Um, I unfortunately missed that, but, um, missed being in New York for, for his funeral, but, um, that's, that's my story. Beautiful. Dan, what, where were you, uh, where do you live? Where were you living when you met Lorenzo? Oh, in New York City. I, I think it was in 2002. Yep, yep, yep. I was going to college at Fordham University at the time. Um, right now I'm joining you from St. Cloud, Minnesota, where I, where I live now. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you. Um, Mary, can you Tell us a little bit about your uh, encounter with Lorenzo and your some some uh, experiences with him. I think you used to drive him around a few times oh, too. I don't drive, but um, I used to <laughs> accompany him around. I used to fly around with him. Uh, my name is Mary Shumkaviak. I am uh, coming to you from beautiful, snowy upstate New York, Rochester, New York, 
where I've been uh, living now for 10 years. I left New York 10 years ago. Um, and I uh, was one of, if not the first, I think there was maybe someone before me, but it wasn't an official position. I was the first CL national secretary. I worked for the movement from uh, 1998 to 2004 when it was a one, one woman job. And then somewhere along the line, Ruro Maniscalco joined me. We had a little cubby hole office that Elba said they hated because it was beneath us. And then we moved uh, much to his delight to uh, the first office that we had in Manhattan, uh, in a big office that we had, it was down on the 21st street, but it was a tiny little cubby hole. And I don't think Lorenzo ever came there. But um, it was, uh, and I don't remember the first time I met Lorenzo, to be honest with you, I don't. But I know that 98, 99, it's when all this stuff was happening. And we were, we were making this big move uh, in New York with Giorgio Vitadini's help and the help of all the people around the world in the movement to actually set up shop in New York officially. Prior to that, we had had a kind of air sats little office down in, um, uh, Bay in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. But um, this was a first official move. And um, we moved, so we moved from 21st Street, much to uh, Lorenzo's delight, I do recall, to Lexington Avenue. And you know, we were in the Gray Bar building and Elba said they love to talk about how every once in a while, and I, me too, but Lorenzo loved that he would run into Henry Kissinger in the elevator because Kissinger was up on one of the higher floors and we were on the 27th floor. And the Graybar building, if you don't know New York City, is attached attached to uh, Grand Central Station. And so, and it's a lovely old building and Grand Central at that time was being redone. So it was just a lovely place. And Lorenzo loved coming to that office. He would spread out all his stuff in the middle of the office and, and pens and whatever. And then, and then tell me things that I needed to do, you know, um, I still recall many, many times, um, uh, somebody mentioned it in the video or somewhere, his obsession with uh, the weather. <laughs> and um, I just, he would say, call. remember that was the old days when you couldn't, uh, it, CNN was on all the time, but we didn't have a TV in the office or whatever. So he would like say, call the, call LaGuardia, you know, there was like a weather number. Remember that when they used to have weather numbers? I want to know what the temperature is at LaGuardia Airport, which I loved. I like, it was one of his particular things that I thought was very cute about him. Um, I had a great, I mean, I, I've been thinking about him a lot this year. Uh, with the COVID, with the whole political situation, I can't tell you how many times in a panic over the last year, I thought to myself and talked to him and said, oh my God, Lorenzo please send us some guidance, send some justice our way, send some uh, calmness for me because I really need to hear somebody with a voice of reason. And um, I was lucky because at that time we were introducing all the books of Father Giussani. Religious Sense was introduced at the, at the UN. And then uh, we did the origin of the Christian claim. And I don't know if I remember this all correctly or not, but we did a big three day uh, extravaganza at Georgetown University where we introduced and and there was a, a cardinals and and people and and one of the people who was there was Cardinal Ratzinger okay who eventually became Benedict the 16th and I love telling this story because it's classic Albacete day and me too um, there was like a cocktail hour or something before the first um, uh, like a little get together before the whole thing began and there were all these serious scholars who were going to talk about the origin of the Christian claim. And um, Elba Sete and I were, were in a group of people with, um, uh, I think Cardinal O'Malley was there, but I don't recall. But I do remember it was the uh, Cardinal before the current Cardinal of New York. Um, and I can't think of his name right now. It's escaping me. But a big old Irish guy, just like the current one. Egan. And, oh, Egan. There you go. And Cardinal Egan was telling some jokes and, and there was the, the older Cardinal who passed away, the, who was never uh, a Cardinal of an actual city, uh, but he was a, a scholar, older, very old man, uh, Dulles, Dullis, uh, Avery, uh, Avery Dulles, I think, okay. 
and oh, and they were telling store Irish jokes about New York City, or whatever. And we were guffawing, and, and Alba said they was adding his two cents. And Cardinal Ratzinger was talking to somebody else behind us one day to be Benedict the Sixteenth, and he turned around and he shushed me and Lorenzo. Okay, and Lorenzo looked at me and said, and I swear to God, he said to me, count yourself lucky, Mary, you've just been shushed by a future Pope. <laughs> that was Lorenzo. And I, so I always care when people ask me about what I did in my previous lives, when I'm here in Rochester, and sometimes we get into stories about Catholicism or whatever, I often share the fact that I was shushed by Benedict XVI. Um, but Lorenzo was involved. He was actually, it was his fault. Okay. And I did also, um, in, I just wanted to say two things about the, the video. I, I loved it. It brought me to tears when, um, first of all, for its playfulness, which was very Lorenzo, but two things really, really struck me was one was when, uh, when Olivetta was talking about when she went with Lorenzo to see Father Giussani. And Father Giussani said to her, dobbiamo far questo per tutto, dobbiamo far tutto per questo uomo. We have to do everything for this man. That's what Don Giussani said to Olivetta. And so I remember ben, I, 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 I was a, accompanying him on many flights. We used to have a lot of fun uh, buying junk pens and trashy novels in every airport store, uh, in every place. We used to travel all over the country. Um, he, but I would, I got to travel with him and I, and sometimes I remember being like, wow, this guy is so not put together. You know, the crumbs on the thing, the cigarette ashes, the this, the that, you never knew where anything was. And yet when you agreed to, to fare tutto for that man, to do everything for that man, whether Olivetta asked me to do something or somebody else asked me to do something for him, uh, you were in for an adventure and he looked at you he had a humility and a heart. You could be standing next to Benedict the Sixteenth, the next, future Benedict the Sixteenth, and Lorenzo was interested in what you were saying, as interested as he was in what Ratzinger was saying. And so um, that really struck me. And the other thing was the, I often, I, Lorenzo was not my confessor. Uh, I do recall going to confession once or twice to him, and um, it was a hoot. I will tell you that. But uh, he. Um, I, I often struggled back then, and I still, I don't struggle as much anymore, but I often struggle back then with what the meaning of everything was. And um, I think the dinosaur thing that it's at the very end of the video is the most beautiful thing, where he says, I, I, I honestly would believe if I was told that dinosaurs were created because this little boy Noah likes dinosaurs. And that's to me as Albacete. And uh, I miss him. I would love to be able to call him on the phone right now and ask him a million questions about what he thinks about what's happening in our world. And I know he's watching over us and I, and I hope he's watching over me because I definitely need him. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Mary. That's great. Um, okay. Uh, I, my uh, the final person I'm going to call on is uh, John Capobianco, um, who is actually a good friend of mine. Um, and the way that I met Lorenzo uh, was uh, through John. Um, my husband and I are in the same parish uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland, as uh, as John and his wife Maria, our dear friends, and their family. Uh, and when I, uh, John's daughter and my daughter were in our parish school together um, uh, in the same class. So um, we met in a very American Catholic way um, through, through the parish, the parish school. Uh, and when I met John, we were both doing communications work in different fields. Um, but the more I got to know him, I um, was struck that he had been formed in a totally different way <laughs> than I had been formed. And um, 
uh, and my question uh, ultimately, what you know, was the, the question that uh, you hear so often um, within the movement: Where did you get this? You know, who gave this to you? And um, and the answer uh, was: um, Come and come and meet. Lorenzo. And so, um, so John and I have been working together ever since. And uh, that's, um, that's the way I uh, met, um, met Albacetti. So John, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Beth. And hello, everyone. Um, the video that John put together was really quite beautiful and exceptional. And to see everything that he put together um, really corresponded to everything that I know about Lorenzo. So it was something that you can trust and um, really rely on to get to know this unique and, and beautiful priest, um, which is how I met him in the mid seventies. Uh, he was assigned to our parish as Mary Beth had uh, described. And uh, he was assigned there by Cardinal Baum uh, in residence. And um, I was very active in my parish uh, in college as a retreat leader. And I was at the rectory a lot. And um, my occasion to meet Lorenzo was very dramatic. He challenged me initially, uh, asked me what I was doing as a retreat leader working with high school students, and then declared that I was a complete phony. And so I was you know, rather intrigued by his approach. Um, and challenged and said, no, no, this was not the case. I assured him that I was authentic. And um, we would meet a few other times in the, in the rectory and he continued to pursue and to challenge me to, um, you know, how serious I was about my Catholic faith and he, with a, a great sense of humor. And then at one point he became very specific and he said, no, no, I'm serious and I will challenge, I, let's, the next time I see you at mass, I will, I will challenge you and I will ask you a question. And if you don't answer the question correctly, you will have decided that you're not worthy to receive communion and therefore uh, I will not give you communion. And so I said, okay, you're on, let's, let's do this. And, and it took about three weeks later for me to be, uh, kneeling at the communion rail at the time we were kneeling and he was coming around and he asked me uh, he stops and he asks me and as he's about to give communion and he puts Jesus back in the ciborium he says ah your hour has now come and I thought oh my god what am I getting into here how is it possible <laughs> that we are at this point and so he um he asked me um Okay, so what was the council that declared the infallibility of the Pope? And of course, after 12 years of Catholic education and into college, I, I didn't even know what a council was. I, I couldn't even make up the answer. So I looked at him as sheepishly and I said, I, I, I really don't know, I'm, I'm sorry. And he looks at me and he says, well, then you can't get communion. And so he moves down to the next person at the communion rail and I'm sitting there kneeling. And uh, he goes down and I'm waiting, wondering, okay, how am I gonna handle this? And uh, some other parishioner comes behind me and says, it's, it's the Council of Trent and whispers in my ear. And I said, all right, I got him. I got him now, here we go. And so, uh, he comes back and he's, he looks as he stops in front of me again and he says, ah, so here you are and your hour has come. So now, did you figure out the answer? And I look at him and I say, it's the Council of Trent. And he looks at me and he says, no, that's wrong. <laughs> and he moves on to the next person. And I'm by this point all alone at the communion rail and everyone has left. And so I notice on the other side, we have a kind of a circular communion rail. And I noticed that he has, uh, there's one spot left. So I went to go receive communion to another uh, priest on the other side of the communion rail. 
and and so I went back and I noticed that everyone on the side of the the church where I was walking, they were all tisk tisking and and wondering, oh my God, how horrible that I was treated. And they were talking to me and we gathered after mass and I said, no, no, this this is not the case. Um, so I went back to visit Lorenzo in the in the sacristy afterwards, and he's he drops, he was still vested, and he drops immediately to his knees in front of me. And he says, I'm so sorry I've taken this too far. I've given scandal and and I I I am so sorry I treated you this way. And I'm trying to lift him up. And I said, No, 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 Lorenzo, you you are absolutely right. And um, you have nothing to be afraid of. You, um, from now on, you are the teacher and I am the student and let's move together. And, and that was the start of a relationship that we had had. And he, he looked at me and he said, well, okay. And so come and see me tomorrow. Of course, as everyone has described, I drove him everywhere in Washington as we as we kind of grew together. Um, he had an enormous impact on my life. He changed everything. And the difference that to me, you know, this was before he met or knew Giuseppe, but he introduced me to Jesus Christ in a way and with a passion and with a knowledge of someone that he knew and someone that he loved deeply. And so it was one of the greatest gifts I ever received in my life uh, from this man who changed everything for me. So as a, as a parish priest, we hear so much about parish priests these days. Lorenzo was completely authentic for me. He did everything that a priest sh should do. He prepared me for my marriage. He, he helped me to understand and recognize the woman that I would come to marry and, and would bear my children. And we would grow together. And he uh, helped me to see that relationship in a totally different way that had been shown to me before. And so um, I shaped my life. I, he, he also became my confessor. He became my dissertation advisor because uh, uh, I went on to get a master's degree in religious education because Lorenzo helped me to see that after uh, getting a degree in communications and wanting to share my life and my communication skills with the church, he um, uh, you know, re helped me to recognize I didn't know what I was talking about after all this time. So he, he helped shape that. And uh, it was really quite beautiful. And it was really in growing with him, setting up a company to specialize in Catholic communications and allow that work to shape my life. It has become and been my life's work and uh, meeting beautiful people along the way. And as he did, my last story is really going with him to Puerto Rico. And it was then that I recognized the importance of Monsignor Giussani in his life because um, I uh, visited him a couple of times and I was actually, um, it was just by chance a visit when he was released of his duties uh, as the president of the university in Puerto Rico and we were there together. And we actually flew back to Washington and um, there were others who saw this as a very difficult time for Lorenzo. I was just so angry at the people who had done this to him. And he was um, very, in many ways, calm about it. But it was really Monsignor Giussani who recognized the beautiful gift that Lorenzo was. And was willing to embrace him and ask him to come and be in FCL and, and give his gifts there where others were not as interested. 
in, in that. And to me, uh, I didn't know Monsignor Giussani from Adam, but I was like, if he knows how to be a friend and to love others the way Lorenzo does, then I'm all in with Monsignor Giussani and uh, happy to do so. And so this was to me a great gift. Um, not only as my friend Lorenzo was suffering at that time, but that someone would embrace him the same way was, uh, was a beautiful uh, thing to see that friendship could be counted on. Even when, as Lorenzo was like, everyone was asking what he would do at that time. And he said, well, people get closed down on Broadway all the time, you know, and they <laughs> pop up in another show. So. That's right. So I'm sorry to rattle on, but that's my two stories of how Lorenzo shaped and had changed my life completely. So, and I am enormously grateful for that. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, all right. I think that we are uh, ready to begin our questions and answers. So uh, if, uh, do we have a question, Teresa? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Um, we don't. Um, so I really. Oh, gosh. Yes. I encourage everyone just to ask your questions about Monsignor. <laughs> Feel free. And um, I'm sure everyone here would love to answer, answer any questions. All right. Well, uh, in the meantime, uh, Mary, can you tell us what what was your favorite part of the uh, the Alba City show? Oh, the, the, I mean, it was all great because yeah. it really, I mean, like I said, Tui, I see over there. So uh, this is, I was going to say, I think we have John Tui with us. So huzzah, John Tui. So this is me stroking your ego, Tui, which, you know, um, <laughs> but it was fantastic. And like I said, the Monty Python esque scene changes, and it was yes. just fantastic yes. and very much captured that playfulness that was Lorenzo, but also. Also, some of the parts are really moving, you know, seeing some of those pictures of Lorenzo and and um, hearing um, his words that from the letter that he wrote to Father Giussani read were it was very powerful. And like I said, I started crying when when Olivetta told her story, because mm -hmm. that to me um, really was the intersection for me. For me, I'm somebody who's been in the movement. I met the movement uh, before it was even here in the United States in 1982 in Bologna in Italy where I was studying and um, I had the great uh, I had the great opportunity to uh, meet Father Giussani several times in my life and and I the movement changed my life Seattle the way people the people I met in Italy the people later on when we uh, started um, tried to start stuff in New York in like 1985 ish I guess um, it changed my life that's all there is to it and for him to join in that into that um, place was was a beautiful thing, and it was like a, a a a completion of something. Like a yeah, this is my this is my on this side of the pond. I don't have to call somebody in Italy. I've got somebody here, and it's Lorenzo. And and so that was very moving to me when Father Giussani said to Olivetta, "We have to give this man everything." You know that um, that to me is. Per, unbelievable and i also really like i said i love the dinosaur thing that's um yeah. elvis said it was completely non-scandalizable there was nothing you could say or ask or put in front of him that would you know make his head blow off the top of his head blow off he would never and so when this little kid says oh i know about dinosaurs and elvis said they says yeah god might have created them just for you because you like them because he knows everything and he knows all time and space that comforts me okay just I didn't know that story I never heard it or probably somebody told it to me probably Alba said they told it to me and I didn't recall it but when I saw it today it really it really um it's something that I will go back to again and again that maybe dinosaurs were invented for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes absolutely uh Dulce do you have a yes I have a couple of um uh, comments, uh, one of them from John Tui. Um, <laughs> let me just um, 
But Great. we're going to go ahead and unmute John, and you can go ahead and ask your question or share your comment, John. Thank you. No, I was just going to say that, that the dinosaur video in particular is just one of the things, no one has seen that in 20 years except me. I followed, um, there was a point where I just got a video camera and just started following him around. I, I just decided I wasn't going to ask anybody's permission, and I followed him and some and things <laughs> leaning around and started filming them. And, and then these tapes sat in my, uh, they were really like in my attic, and I'd forgotten I had them actually until we started, because I've been like telling everybody, oh, we want to collect all the materials, and I'd forgotten that I actually filmed him. And so I started working the singing that I realized I had these tapes and I remembered that story. I remembered him saying that, uh, that was something I like, I remember for 20 years. And I was like, I've got to find that. I wonder if it matched my memory. And I put the tape in, I was like, oh my God, it's exactly like I remembered. And this is really powerful. I have to share this with people. So that's why, you know, I really wanted to end the, the uh, I was set to show with that because I thought it was just so, unique so expressive of him and then um the other thing i say is like most of the things in there are either things that were very rare that would be very hard to find on youtube or things that no one like the the question he had that uh, that uh that they asked about and that then i cut all the covets the scenes of the past year and mm -hmm. uh, you know about um you know, it, was it easier for, it must've been easier 2000 years ago to know Jesus than today was something yeah. that someone had sent the forum of recording of him. And again, I, so I wanted to really share all these, uh, just a little bit of the treasures that we're gathering right now to, to let people know. So that, that's why that's in there. So yeah, that's why that's in there. And uh, I thank John for participating and Dan Bushman had a special guest appearance in the video. Yeah. So, <laughs> I just want to say- make. I'm glad everybody liked it. Thanks. So it looks like we have Fred. Um, you want to say something, Fred Kaffenberger? Sure. sure. Hi. Uh, yeah. So um, I met. Uh, I heard uh, uh, Lorenzo Albacetti in 2002 when he came to Benedictine College uh, to speak on the religious sense. So that was, um, you know. Uh, so I'm thinking when um, when I went, I didn't know anything about him, but I had known Schindler. Before that, David Schindler of the John Paul II Institute. Before that, and I had subscribed to Communio for a couple of years. So I said, "Oh," I said to my wife, "I said, okay, this guy looks interesting. He's been in Communio." And she, my my wife, having looked at Communio, rolled her eyes at me and said, "Oh dear God." And so I went by myself, and I went to Benedictine, and uh, I heard him. I don't remember a thing he said. <laughs> But I just came home and I said, okay, uh, this is it. This is what we've been looking for. Let's go. Uh, he's going to be speaking again tomorrow night and you're going to come with me. And she said, okay. <laughs> she said, I, I'm not, I, I'm in protest, but I'm going to go. And, and she was nursing uh, our daughter at the time. So uh, here she is dragging along the baby and, and we're, we're there. And so, and she says, wow, you are right. And then um, the other thing that had happened was uh, that uh, um, I was at the talk in Missouri where uh, Monsignor Alba said he spoke to, uh, spoke at William Jewell College. And so I couldn't tell you a thing he said there either, except for one thing that I remembered because of the Alba Seti show. And that is, uh, and I just saw him, in, he, you know, people are asking him questions about the Catholic Church. He's giving all these crazy answers, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have no idea. You know, he, he was just doing this kind of stuff. And then at a certain point, um, he says, You know what really interests me? And then he starts talking about some animal he saw on the Discovery Show. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So that was, uh, those were the, the stories that I wanted to share. Thank That's you. wonderful. Thank you, Fred. Um, other questions? No? Okay. I'm not seeing any other rents right now, I, but we... That's fine. I'm going to take the time then to ask a question if there aren't yeah. other questions. Please do it. John, I was incredibly moved by what you, um, what you shared about that, that kind of initial encounter because uh, in, a, in a very similar way, right, being called out as a fraud was the way that uh, I became Lorenzo's friend, too. Um, 
And I'm, I'm interested because I met him much later, right? I, I met him in 2000, well, in college a little bit, so that would have been around like 2000, 2001, but really got to know him a little bit later than that. Um, but my experience with him was all, all after the movement. So I met a guy who had met Jusani, and I'm just curious, you've know, you knew him throughout, right? You knew him from uh, maybe not as far back as Puerto Rico when he was a kid, but certainly as a young, uh, a young priest uh, all the way through his involvement in the movement. I'm just curious, from your perspective, how that uh, encounter with Jusani uh, took shape for him. How, how did he share that with you? Sure. No, I, to me, Giussani confirmed everything for Lorenzo that he was always pursuing, but it never really crystallized the same way um, in terms of the, the way to live it, the kind of the method. He was always kind of searching for that. He was always very, um, you know, authentic in his approach with Cardinal Baum. You know, this was all before he was meeting John Paul II and they were doing things together. And, you know, he was aware, it seemed to me of Monsignor Giussani, but it wasn't quite like he wasn't really, you know, um, studying or pursuing exactly what he, what he was doing. But I think it was really meeting him, meeting him through, you know, um, uh, the movement and and kind of uh, the introduction through Cardinal Scola and 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 that kind of personal confirmation that this totally corresponds to the gospel. It totally corresponds to his understanding of who Jesus Christ is and how he loves others. And it, it was to me that relationship, that confirmation that this friendship is something that you can really trust and you can build your life upon. And so in, in that way, I think Monsignor Giussani became for him someone who, who really lived what he had been searching for. And, and that was, really true for me when I met Lorenzo. It was, you know, the, the church's teachings didn't really correspond um, for me. They were um, things that I had tried to build my life on, but it didn't make as, as clear a reference to, and, and this is clear, not in the sense of, uh, you know, a better understanding or a better, you know, example of how to live a morality, but clear in terms of this is someone I can give my life to. And this is someone who I can, I can love and who has shown me how to love in a way. And I think that's what he found in Monsignor Giussani and it just continued to correspond. To me, the, the greatest story, I, I don't know if it's been heard, you know, through the, through the movement and stuff, but at the time, you know, Lorenzo was spending time with John Paul II and going back and forth to Rome. And the greatest story for me was when uh, they were trying to set up an arrangement for him to meet uh, JP2 in Rome. And, um, and, and Lorenzo was supposed to have his schedule available and they picked a time and Lorenzo said, I can't do that. I have another meeting. And the, and the Pope got on the phone and said, well, what, what, you have another meeting? Who else is more important that you should go to? And, and Lorenzo sheepishly said, well, I'm supposed to meet Monsignor Giussani that day. And, and he said, the Pope said, oh, well, that probably is more important right? <laughs> <laughs> than the meeting that we had planned, which I just love. And I think Lorenzo was like, well, okay, yeah, this is, so I, it, it was that personal encounter with him. And, and, you know, the words, the unpacking of the books and the things, I mean, it's it, all important, but it, to me, it was, this was a man who lived what the gospel proposes live someone beautifully in love with Jesus Christ. And what does that mean for today? And I, I found that in Lorenzo originally, 
when he smacked me down and it was not a smackdown as a it you know to destroy me it was a smackdown to kind of say look there's much more and you can pursue it and let's pursue it together and that was his offer and i um am so grateful that even as a college student i was aware to say okay let's I, i'm in let's do this so Thanks for the question. I, I think it's really important. Yep. Okay. Do we have time for one more question, timekeepers? No, students, <laughs> no. Okay. So no more time, but uh, thank you everyone for the wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to um, everyone from uh, the Abacete Forum. Uh, who uh, worked so hard. I know that through the, um, the creation of the wonderful Albacete show that John put together that um, he was able to have some wonderful, amazing conversations with many friends of Lorenzo. So stay tuned because um, we have a lot of uh, wonderful things now in the archives, which uh, hopefully we will continue to, to work on and uh, be able to bring bring to you. Um, so, okay, I have my closing script now that I, I have to read like a, like a, good, um, a good forum member. Um, we wanna thank everybody for your participation.